Welcome to this HFS video cast. I'm Mark Reed Edwards, marketing leader at HFS. Today we talk with one of the analysts behind the HFS apps modernization top 10 for 2022, which was just released. Joining me is research leader, Joel Martin. Joel, welcome. Good morning, Mark. Nice to see you. It's great to see you. What's at the core of the HFS apps modernization top 10? Well, fundamentally at the core is a, a we delve deeply into what's going on with regards to you know that journey to cloud native and what that means from an application and data perspective um, common terms like rehost re-architect refactor renew retire are all explored on how different service providers in fact 17 different service providers participated in this and gave us basically a lot of insights into how they're working with customers to drive business outcomes throughout modernization which includes everything from lifting and shifting uh, SAP technology stack to the cloud, to developing microservices using containers, Kubernetes, and uh, Docker, uh, and then how they apply agile, security, data methodologies, um, their own solutions for automating the assessment, discovery, and, and even automating the recoding uh, of different solutions to, to really accelerate that move to the cloud. Sounds like the modern world, right, in, in IT. It does. The biggest challenge they're facing is there's not enough people to play in this modern world. Uh, one of the big things that came out early on in the discussions were, you know, there's not enough talent that understands this developing apps for the cloud, whether it's serverless or edge, uh, whether it's microservices and Kubernetes, everybody's looking for them. They're enterprise customers, the software vendors themselves, um, and of course the services partners. So yeah. a lot of efforts were going into partnering with universities, a lot of internal certification programs, a lot of training, and a lot of elbows up to keep that talent in-house. Um, one of the biggest uh, feedback, uh, feedback, one of the biggest parts of feedback that I received for the enterprise users was, we can't keep our, our, our teams in this virtual world. Those that have the skills are so sought after, it's really hard to, to keep them in-house. So they're, they're really leaning on their partners to help augment their staff and, and pivoting to what they call full stack developers rather than Kubernetes experts or Docker experts because you know, those skills while, in, um, while needed are in such high demand, it's just hard to retain them. Talent is a common denominator in just about every subject we deal with, isn't it? Sure is. I mean, Phil did a great discussion not too long ago with a bunch of executives talking about the talent strategies. And, and it, nowhere is it more true than in, in this move uh, from digital to the one office to what we're calling the one ecosystem. But that digitalization, using talent to basically drive um, uh, the delivery of software and services is, is just so critical. And it's hard to keep the best talent because they've got choices now. They, they don't have to move to Santa Clara, San Jose, Austin, Texas. They can, they can you know, stay in remote, you know, Massachusetts if they want. <laughs> right, right. So, so let's talk about the top 10. Can you tell me what you saw in the providers you studied? And also, you know, what are enterprises looking for? Yeah, the biggest thing I saw in the providers, really beyond their focus on acquiring and growing talent inorganically and organically, was how they were really shifting from being traditionally focused on taking on projects and being outsourcers to working collaboratively with both technology and the business. Uh, I, I spent a lot of time in briefings talking about how they were moving from, you know, my, a mindset of big A agile, a methodology common, commonly used in software development to, to little A agile where they really stress the need for something that's become very common in technology, squads or pods of individuals coming together for projects, but including the business in that. Um, working with the business became critical over the last two years. In fact, roughly 60% of the opportunities that come up are funded by the business. Thus, they're really driving um, part of the RFP process to include outcome-based or output-based pricing. And fundamentally, what that means is they want their partners to share in the risk and the reward of the success of those programs, whether it's driving internal efficiencies or it's gaining share in the marketplace. A big focus of these projects and, and something that was a big part of our scoring was how well 
the different partners and customers rated each other on the ability to to drive outcomes and share in that reward. Um, you know what they brought to the table that allowed them to get there from talent to technologies to partnerships to pricing models was very important when we looked at this because really app modernization is is about this you know uh, becoming you know moving your business to the cloud it's not about moving your technologies to the cloud i mean that's the undercurrent of it but it's really about the process the workflow the collaboration you know breaking down those silos so so we really spent a lot of time uh, really delving into that with whether it was Cognizant or Accenture or Hexaware or Zenzar. Um, we got some great feedback and, and had some really great interactions with those that really latched onto that and had some clear proof points on that point. Well, you mentioned some names, so let's talk about the, you know, what, who, who were the top providers uh, and, and where, where do they excel? In the top 10, you know, the. Uh, it came. It was very hard because there was a lot of great stories. Where we landed, uh, number one was Cognizant, followed by Infosys, followed by Accenture. Number four was IBM, and number five was EY. All excelling in different parts, all with consistent and strong stories, um, and all just um, with with the case studies, with the vision, and, and with the ability to execute that that brought them to the top of the heap. Um, Cognizant brought together some amazing examples of how it's really refocused and driven a mindset around that small A agile, working with business and technology, really, really articulating well their journey uh, of discovery that was less about the technology, more about what the business needed to succeed, and then showing the flexibility to adapt and deliver that. Uh, that was echoed in their uh, end user case studies uh, when we interviewed their end users directly. And so it really built out their story. Infosys, their partnerships, their investment in whether it's technology partnerships or universities, developing the talent and then bringing in new technologies and really honing their message around a product centric organization, using agile and low code for, for you know, sharing talent and reskilling teams uh, was a really strong message that came through time and time again as we, we dove into Infosys. Accenture, very exciting at number three. I mean, domain expertise, the ability to really look at what the business needed and then decouple the front office and back office needs so that they could successfully meet those uh, end goals uh, really drove them to, to the third spot. IBM was going through a lot of changes and, you know, they scored very well, number two in a hyperscaler's research and, and at modernization definitely have the skills. Their garage teams, uh, really driving the innovation and the ideation with their customers was important. Uh, the other big piece that came out with IBM was, of course, you know, its ability to execute an application's modernization through its partnerships, but also with its, you know, subsidiary Red Hat. Um, Red Hat OpenShift, very important piece, not only used by, by IBM, by a lot of enterprises that we spoke to. So a very common tool and, and really something that differentiates IBM is both a services and software company in this in this mix. Um, and then number five, EY. EY uh, has really popped up a lot in our top tens recently. And a lot of that's just how strong, how passionate its customers are about the teams that are coming in and driving thought leadership. They scored number one in the uh, voice of customer. And I had never heard a customer so excited about working with a service provider on a five-year project that kept evolving and changing and, and spoke so highly of the talent, the skills, but most, most importantly, the leadership that came in and worked with them through architecting their platform, their data, and their application strategy. Um, other important ones, you know, that came up, obviously, you know, WePro and TCS, perennial all-stars, uh, WePro doing some really interesting things uh, towards the end of the year with, with their, their full stride, but also their top coder. So we talked a little bit about talent and they really had focused on building out a community of these mercenary developers, if you will, for their customers and the extended market. So, so a lot of growth there and, and really see them getting aligned behind that. TCS, I mean, what they bring to the table, very strong in industry, very strong with the ability to, to align and bring a, um, 
so many different partners uh, into the job. So, so really, no job was you know outside their realm of expertise when it came came to expertise they could bring to the project. It sounds like a very comprehensive. A lot of uh, blood, sweat, and tears went into it. I really want to thank you for joining me to give people a taste of of what this top ten is all about, Joel. My pleasure, Mark. Good to see you. Great to see you. You can read this top 10 at hfsresearch.com along with all of our research and a growing library of videocasts just like this one. We'll see you on the next HFS videocast.